Hey, how's it going? Hey, Bill. Happy Monday. Happy Monday. You already make your trip back to the U.S. and, and back again now? Uh, I'm actually going in about like just over a month. So I'm very excited to be going home for the first time in like a year and a half. Yeah, I can imagine. I can imagine. Yeah. Cool. It's a good time of the year too. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> it's vaccine season. <laughs> yeah, that too. I was thinking mainly weather, but you're right. Yeah, it's, it's also good weather too. So yeah, I'm very excited. Thanks everybody for joining today. Um, we'll get started a little bit after the hour to allow people time to join. If you wanna put your name uh, in the meeting notes, uh, that'd be great and then we can get um, started in a little bit. So thanks. Howdy, y'all. Hey, Taylor, how was spring break? Oh, it was pretty good. A lot of doing nothing, which was nice. I mean, some spring cleaning, but mainly just enjoying the sun and relaxing. Nice. Kiddos were away for the week. So that meant I did nothing. Freedom. <laughs> Hi all, we'll give until um, five after. Hi all, we'll give until five after um, the meeting notes are in the Zoom chat. I'll repost for those who just joined. Oh, that's my name. That's not, let's try again, paste. There we go. And you can add your name and whatever agenda items.
I will get started in about one minute. Okay, it's five after. Um, thanks everyone for joining today. In case you got lost on the way here, this is the weekly meeting of the CNF uh, working group. And in case you don't have the meeting notes already, I'm gonna put it um, in the chat so that you can have it. Um, before we jump in, is there anything anyone would like to add to the agenda? Um, hearing nothing, we can probably jump in then. So um, the first thing is the use case template um, that uh, Vuk put together. Um, in case people weren't on the uh, call last week, um, we said we were ready to merge this one once. Um, Vuk had taken out his um, use case um, so that we could have them in two separate PRs and he did that, so thank you for doing that earlier. Um, unless anybody has any last second comments, like very, very last seconds, we're gonna merge this pull request. Okay, cool. Um, so I know I saw that book was on the call. So thank you for um, creating the use case template. And so for people that are new or don't remember what this is, um, this is a template for people that want to submit um, use cases, and these are going to be the backing of all of our best practices um, in the CNF working group. So every, every single best practice needs to have a, an actual real world use case behind it. So thank you both for putting this together. Um, the second question I had for Vuk is, I know you already written up a use case. Um, did you want to, did you have a pull and then you pulled it out? Are you gonna make that as a separate pull request now? Uh, yeah, actually I uh, was looking to, to close this uh, merge request uh, and remove the branch and I'll create a new branch and um, put that uh, another uh, use case actually example uh, as, as a new pull request. Okay. So I didn't create it, uh, maybe in the course of the call, uh, I could just uh, push it and okay. I can present what it is, but uh, I didn't uh, prepare. Okay, yeah, no worries. Maybe if you can do that in the background, we can circle back okay. to that at the end okay. of the call. Good, I'll yeah. do. Cool, thank you. Um, so then the second one is, uh, we talked about last week about the elections, about how it'd be helpful to have some type of deadline for legal in terms of getting stuff in. Um, and essentially this is a one line change about interested parties. So interested parties can be added at any time but must be added at least one week before any elections to have a vote. Uh, I, so right now, Taylor, I saw, Oh, was it uh, 14 minutes ago? So I haven't read this yet. Uh, this is just new because I'm trying to catch up this week since oh, I'm okay. out. And I, I was reading a lot of the Slack messages and it seemed like there was still a uh, discussion around what um, uh, individuals versus parties and how that affected voting and all the other things. And it, it seems like we may have other areas that aren't that may not be counted. Anyways, I'm mainly wanting to make sure we're clear if, if this section is really going to be, you have to be listed or you get no vote, then that I think is really important for everyone to, to have. Yeah, I guess the initial thought, well, this is just right, a vote for the co-chairs and the tech leads. Um, and 
why I guess maybe to give the context about this was the problem that some people are running into is um, in like larger companies, they're like, okay, why do we need to add, like, when's the deadline for like doing this, you know? And if there isn't any deadline, then it's not gonna get done. And so it'd be easier if there was, hey, you need to be in by this time, otherwise um, you don't get a vote. I guess, so we're not trying to discourage people from adding themselves in as an interested party. Um, so that's why you, they said they could be added at any time. They just, we kind of need to put a deadline for that. I know that we need to have some way of, of knowing who's eligible to vote and it, that makes sense. I, I'm just not clear on that. Um, for this being the way to do it, interested party and, and the other. It, I may have misread or misunderstood other um, CNCF and Kubernetes groups that have the interested party section, um, but I wasn't attaching that to voting eligibility. So that's how we have it written right now. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, that could certainly change in the future if we wanna change how we do our elections. Um, but if we look at the actual charter right now, um, it is somewhere in here. Each organization interested in the interested party section has one vote. So right now we're basing the voting off the interested party section. That could certainly change in the future, but that's how it is right now. Right, that makes a lot more sense. Mm -hmm. So does that answer your question here? It makes sense why it's listed there. Um, yeah. I, I guess I'm concerned that about in making sure that we're including everybody. Yeah. Right now, it, when we first created that section, um, the, I think the main purpose was around communicating the interest from organizations in the in industry. So yeah. That, Anyone, you know, other companies coming in that go, oh, I see that they're involved and what is this about? And they get involved or CNCF orgs or, you know, other projects. They go, oh, all these groups are interested. Let's see what's going on and maybe get in. That was where I was seeing the main focus of that section um, separate from the voting. <clears throat> okay. But I'm, yeah. I'm look at some of the stuff like the Kubernetes um, steering committee um, and other, the, here's the community voting. There's some of them that have their own, like there's a whole section, but. Election. So what, Taylor, what I hear you saying is that you want a separation between participating companies that get to vote and interested parties that just want to come in and look. Is that what you're getting at? I don't know that that's required, but that was where my brain, what, yeah, how so I was seeing it. And um, if- That's what I hear you say, uh, but that is what not the, that's not how the charter is written though. Right, I, I agree with you. So the, I guess some of the comments in the Slack, that um, the Slack channel for the CNF working group, are about individuals and groups and how do we deal with all these things. And um, mainly I wanna make sure that everybody that's um, involved in trying to contribute will have a vote. So it, yes, to tie it in with the company stuff that we already have. If you're part of the same company, we already deal with that in the charter. But if, if your company name is not listed and 
somewhere or you or you're not involved with a company directly <clears throat> and it's you're an individual it seems we need to make sure that people are there so if it's part of interested parties fine let's just make sure everybody's listed i, I believe we have a potentially a subset of voters right now is my main concern Okay. Yeah, I tried to kind of follow up with everybody last week that has been on the call to add them as an interested party, but if other people would like to add themselves, um, we're not trying to discourage participation. I guess also kind of related to this discussion is this issue that was brought up last week of what does it actually mean to be an interested party? Because um, right now it gives you voting rights, but do you, you have any like obligations was kind of the question because some people were struggling to get it through their legal department. Uh, is there anything you have to worry about um, if you have your name listed there? Uh, and similarly, um, is it going to change over the course of time? Because if your obligations change, you might reconsider your participation and these documents are all effectively changeable. Yeah. And so I think, yeah, kind of all of this is how do we, we, we have like the first step of governance, but how do we get to like step two? I guess the question um, and kind of once we get like off the ground. I'm certainly happy to like help with that too. Um, I think kind of once we get this through this election cycle, I think the co-chairs will be in a good position to help hopefully like lead the community to um, the next level of governance, I think. I think there's a lot of great content in the cloud native community already. Um, stuff like um, this, maybe I'll add these to like the issues right now. Um, and also coming out of SIG contributor strategy the, um, that, that we can voters, look at. Uh, Bill, the voters um, yeah, markdown that you have is related to the steering committee, just to make that clear. So that elections MD is the process and the 2020 voters markdown actually is the list of eligible voters. So that I guess the one yeah. of the things to point out um, in the, what was eligible voters for the Kubernetes steering committee, yep. a combination of things. So in my mind, this would maybe be similar to what we would, could do. Um, potentially this is more complex um, than just doing interested parties this year, that's fine. But the idea would be, you could have interested parties combined with contributors that have been making pull requests. They're not listed as interested parties, but we want to accept them too. Mm -hmm. um, right, so that you can, yeah. go, you can go through all this. But the, on that voters MD, it, it kind of says what it is. So you have this list of, of people that were doing um, contributions that are shown with dev stats. So that's the CNCF um, project yeah. that actually looks at, at contributions with commits. And then a list of other eligible voters that were added for other reasons that met other criteria. I'm just wanting to make sure that everybody has a, a voice on this that should, so. If everyone yeah. wants to make it, keep it simple and as an agreement that every everyone needs to be added to the interested parties, then we can go that path. Yeah, I guess, is there anybody on the call that feels like they aren't represented right now in the interested parties and would like to have a vote in the election? And here's, here's who it is um, for this. The only person I don't have a contact for is someone at um, Chenghua Te Telecom. Um, so Aiden has been on the call before, but didn't have any contact info. So I don't have any contact info for someone there. 
Um, and is there anybody else on the call that would like to vote that's not on this list right now? Because the ballots will be going out later today. What about CNCF? CNCF, anybody there get a vote? How does that uh, work? CNCF is staying out of it. Okay. <laughs> We're a neutral third party. But um, Lucina, I saw that you wanted to add vote. Um, is Google listed? Okay, I see that there's... I think Metric and myself, like Madoff, uh, I think we are joining this meeting for the first time from, from Google. So um, happy to be added, but we're just uh, observing for now. Okay. So I can add those three people right now too. Do you see the comment for InfraCloud? Yeah. Okay. At one point, I'd like to have these in alphabetical order, but I yeah. feel like that's. <laughs> and then I'm also going to. Oh, this is terrible. <laughs> Okay. Is there? Okay. And also AT&T. Um, Bill, I noticed that you have an alphabet or alphabetic order. So do you want to reorder? Because I guess some of them are yeah, it's it's out of alphabetical order. <laughs> That's correct. It's maybe if somebody can do that um, in the background while yeah. we I'm in, like creative. Um, okay. And once I um, and then I can merge that at the end of this meeting. Is there anyone else on the call that would like to be added? So in case you missed it, we added uh, Volt Co-op, InfraCloud, Google, and AT&T. And in case you weren't aware, this is now the interested parties list. Can I suggest something? Since the charter is going to be static while the interested parties will change, uh, you may want to keep this as a separate addendum. Yeah. Which is e easily changeable. Yep. I think that's probably a good idea. But I think now that we're getting more formal, we should we, we are, we're we're growing and we need to like kind of restructure how we're doing things. We, we can do that and maybe also the alphabetical reordering in a later pull request. We don't have to do it in the middle of the meeting though. So I mean, yeah. that's fine. Yep. Okay. Um, so. I'll add a note about that and either we can make an issue or somebody can make a PR about that. Um, and then Jeffrey, I, I saw that you made the pull request about creating the glossary. And then <laughs> is, is he on the call today? Um, I am. Yeah, I saw that you added a bunch of definitions and then took a whole bunch out. 
Um, yep. Yeah. Um, would you, I guess, would you, do so you here's think my this, thoughts on this, Bill. Yeah. Um, like if you just go into the main doc, you'll see like, it's just a few things TBD based on what we know we need. Mm -hmm. Things that are going to be contentious, which is probably going to be most things just based on like the last two years um, of what I've seen. Mm -hmm. yeah. I would, um, I would do definitions for things that are new, nebulous, or people assume are pre-existing as either issues or discussions, and then create individual PRs um, for those definitions. Else we will have an empty glossary, I think, for like the next eight months. Um, okay. So yeah, the only one I left in there is the Kubernetes one. I mean, if people really want to argue with the people who <laughs> you know host Kubernetes.io, um, I guess we can have that discussion, but I figured that would be the one least <laughs> controversial one. Um, but yeah, I, I stripped everything out so we can get the template in. People can start starting discussions, um, start making pull requests. So my, my PR ended up becoming pretty lackluster, all things considered, but we could at least get it in place um, and then start working from there is kind of my thought. I also, in the um, notes I linked, so me with my um, clairvoyance, I uh, started a discussion right at the beginning of this group saying, if we don't define this, we're going to fight about it later. And here we are. So there's already some thoughts in there um, for people to continue to rehash at least what a CNF is. And then, um, you know, we can move on to things like cube native, et cetera. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I think it's, yeah, like a, a good place to start. So I'm happy to approve it. I guess maybe if we can either get a, more, a couple more approvals now or like just merge it next week, I don't think. I don't think now it'll be very contentious. <laughs> Maybe before. <laughs> yeah. Um, Structure sounds good. And ideally, we can focus on stuff like that, the more specific things where we can agree on and get those in place, where there may be different terms that have been using across. Like, I think one of the items was use cases that were using different terms, but they actually meant the same thing. They were just different terms. Mm -hmm. So dealing with those early on with new, with new PRs would be good. Yeah. I guess maybe in the interest of um, kind of getting this off the ground so we can kind of start those discussions is, does anybody have any major concerns about merging this as it is like, I don't think there's anything super controversial in here. <laughs> it's just essentially Kubernetes being defined. Well, the only the only comment that I made was about the the tag, which is uh, after the Kubernetes definition. Oh, oh, I did it in in the Slack channel, so oh, that's why it's probably yeah. But I, I'll I be honest, I was too lazy to look up how to do superscripts or subscripts in <laughs> Markdown. Um, I just hadn't got to it yet, so I don't know if there is a way to do that, but we just, we can remove the Kubernetes.io and just put some type of indicator that, you know, obviously yeah. makes a connection down to that reference down there. No, no, Bill, in, in the, the, the definition, uh, after yeah. the definition is like, yeah, the last, uh, the last, last part, yeah. yeah. Yeah, at the very end there, the Kubernetes.io, in the um, uh, MS10 signs. I just put it in as a temporary placeholder to like kind of tag it, but um, we, there should be like something to where like if we're pulling um, a what have you directly out of something, a more, you know, proper citation methodology, I just did that quick, keep it as a placeholder. Okay, I, I guess, do you want it to link to there? Like, well, if you in down in the references, there is, um, I don't think we need to do it because the link is down in the references. We just need like, I didn't want to do the numbering thing yet because these are going to change a bunch and I didn't want to have to constantly update like the numbering huh. order based on like reference um, stuff. But like uh, in reality, you could like drop like a number three there because I think it's the third reference. I just, yeah. some way for us to show, because um, I think we should do small citations in the definitions and then build out the references at the bottom. That way people can go like, yeah, down there. Um, 
They can go yeah. and see where we're pulling stuff from, especially if we're, you know, co-opting an existing definition. Okay. How about changing it to be like a asterisk or something like that? Or C references. Um. Yeah, I mean, maybe the easiest way is like to say, to start numbering them and then every, like, it doesn't matter where things are placed. Because, right, as long as you link, it doesn't matter where it is. And if it's reference one or if it's reference 100, as long as the link works. But, yeah. Um, I guess, does anybody have a strong preference on how we link them? I'm, I'm good with not having to decide now if nobody does. I just changed mine to approve. <clears throat> yeah, I agree with the same. And if someone wants to come back through and go, oh, here's how to do it in Markdown, like, um, yeah, was saying I don't. He didn't know how to do um, superscript or whatever. And then, if someone wants to put something in, they can link it. I guess this is what Ian is always pushing us to do: is merge fast and then come back and change it. Mm -hmm. it it's easier said than done, but yeah, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I guess does anybody have a problem with like merging the like the glossary as it is? Go for it. Okay. So um, thanks, Jeffrey, for putting that together. And I look forward to the, the discussions um, to come out of this. Cool. Um, uh, yeah, the next one is. Um, the issue that created, I don't know, like Ian, have you thought about this at all since last meeting? No, I've been meeting. terrible this week. I will throw it into, uh, I'll put that as a section in the charter and uh, put okay. pull request together, but uh, uh, not the only pull request I've got on my job list, but yes, indeed. Okay. Um, based on comments so far, I'll take out the commentary and basically leave it in pretty much as is. I don't think there's any need to change the wording. Uh, everybody's okay. seen it. Nobody was objecting. Cool. Um, I guess the only thing we really have left is the elections. But before we jump into that, I guess, um, Vuk, have you had a chance to make your pull request? Uh, yeah, actually, you can find it there. Uh, you use case, yeah. Okay. Cool. Um, do you want to just you maybe... You can show it with the... Uh, no, no, three dots. Click three dots on the on the right. Ah. Yeah, and then view file. I think that's the best okay. way to run it. Um, yeah, I, I don't expect this to be uh, uh, merged... Uh, now, but uh, would use the chance to, to explain a little bit uh, what I had uh, in mind behind. So that's essentially a use case, uh, which uh, uh, I am in my function very much uh, close to, and I'm seeing uh, every day uh, uh, frictions coming out of, uh, of that in a real production and uh, real uh, deployment environment, which is essentially how do you uh, uh, you know, what's the relation between uh, a cloud native network function and underlying infrastructure? Uh, and uh, the expectation of, of that is uh, normally that uh, cloud native network function can tolerate a lot and would not be dependent on many things. And this is actually what I try to, to describe. Um, so in terms of uh, involved processes, um, we have operations and, and lifecycle management. 
uh, but indirectly it is uh, going to give a feedback to the development and, and the deployment. Uh, I just wanted to uh, elaborate the use case uh, in its core and not to, to touch everything. Uh, so essentially here we have a two uh, roles and then personas um, involved the, the, the CNF uh, DevOps team uh, at the at the uh, CSP or, or operator uh, side and the cloud native platform. I know that it is going to uh, create some discussion. Uh, I intentionally use it here and we can maybe uh, throw it for the definitions um, to the to the Jeffrey's uh, document. Uh, but I, I said intentionally cloud native platform DevOps. So this is a, a team that uh, uh, manages and develops and, and uh, operates the infrastructure for that. Um, for the involvement system entities, we have a platform, uh, meaning infrastructure, we have a CNF, uh, we have a CICD and then monitoring. And essentially, um, the thing is that there are certain patterns, uh, which I described here, I would uh, call everybody to, to take some time to, to read it, but um, uh, briefly summarized, there are some patterns uh, when you have a, a infrastructure that um, uh, is built for a cloud native applications and cloud native workloads, it assumes or it behaves in a certain way. Uh, it's uh, um, according to the best practices, uh, immutable, uh, declarative, uh, um, it's not highly available, uh, doesn't pretend to be, uh, but offers all the mechanisms for high availability uh, to be realized on application side. And then when you have such infrastructure, uh, uh, there are certain life cycle events that are happening uh, that are assuming that application can, uh, without degraded performance or degraded function, uh, handle those. Uh, and this is what um, would be expected behavior, if you scroll down a bit. Um, so the expected behavior would be that the CNF uh, can cope uh, uh, well with all situations that are happening. Uh, in the infrastructure, especially on the node level. So one of the, the main uh, highlights here, main topic here is when one or more nodes uh, in the Kubernetes clusters are uh, away, going away and then being drained and then uh, reshuffled left and right, um, CNF should be capable to bear it uh, without visible impact uh, on that. And um, another thing is uh, the, the CNF should be uh, able to say if after change in the infrastructure, uh, it is still feeling okay or not. Um, and not to wait like uh, I don't know, whatever certification and, and stuff to happen. So this is uh, currently what would be uh, expected behavior. What challenge is, is that it's not like that in practice. So we have in, in a many uh, instances and examples, we notice that um, the CNFs are actually VNFs, which are just packaging containers, maybe reworked a little bit, uh, maybe have uh, dependencies on the hardware, on the particular nodes and so on. And this is um, not what I would consider being cloud native, uh, at least in respect to, to what's the relation of application to infrastructure. And um, the CNFs are also uh, still following to the large extent this systems integrated approach, uh, which doesn't leave you the, the chance uh, when you change the infrastructure on a weekly or bi-weekly or, or monthly level, uh, doesn't give you a chance uh, to, to uh, still be sure. You, you need to wait the certification cycles and so on. So that's a, that's a situation. Uh, practices I didn't deal with, uh, and uh, I just put uh, here. So we be, because we now need to to uh, probably use that as inspiration to discuss about some best practices, and and we can refer them here where that not available is. I just highlighted um, in this last part of the template um, what should be done differently to overcome these challenges. So. I think it would be fair to say that uh, it's something that would require uh, people to read through and then to comment. So I don't know how much of the discussion we can have now because it's very fresh. So the one, one question from, for the overall approach. So what is the, so it, in this case, like cover the case then like the issue relies on some kind of an observation technology 
which is not available. So do you have a, an opinion uh, I, on that? Like what should happen then? Uh, I lost you, Gergely, for a, a couple oh. of seconds. Uh, can you repeat just uh, yeah. then get the context? So what should happen if, if there, is a, there is an accelerator, hardware accelerator, which is not present in the infrastructure? So how the application should behave? So should it run with degraded performance or should it just like stop trying? So what should be mm -hmm. the approach here? Because like the big question here is that like, does it worth the effort to even run the application without the accelerators? I mean, like, what's the purpose of, uh, I don't know, uh, VCU if it can handle two cells? Mm -hmm. I mean, th this is uh, now, you are going into into particular example behind this use case maybe, or that's related to use case with a specific set of, of assumptions. Uh, I, I think, the things like that could be discussed uh, or should be discussed actually if it's uh, uh, if it's uh, and it's a valid input or valid concern from from your uh, side uh, we should think of how how do we handle those uh, in terms of like uh, do we discuss that in a pr or do we have some breakout sessions uh, or, or something because there are a couple of uh, ideas that come to my mind uh, where your question is coming from and for example on that particular case, we see a lot of today's CNFs are simply using uh, uh, and, and might have this issue with the accelerators um, being present or not present because they rely on DPDK and SRIOV, which is a typically uh, the, the, the virtualization uh, technology that got ported and transported into, into cloud native world. Um, but uh, if we look like, you know, what are the potential alternatives? What are more cloud native alternatives? We might come to XDP, to eBPF, to all the stuff. But th this is all going into already going into into best practices, so, which is not uh, the the purpose of of uh, use case. Use case should uh, let, let me, trigger let the discussion. Me, let, let me all the just, problems. So, let, let me just ask a couple of questions, which might help here a bit. One is. Right. If we imagine, for instance, um, an IPsec endpoint, right, it could consume a, a um, an accelerator if it exists. But if it doesn't exist, it could work without as well. So that would be, if you like, two flavors of that IPsec endpoint. And there'll be more flavors. There'll be ones that run, you know, higher capacities or lower capacities. You might deploy it in different ways, depending. So um, it would be possible to say, well, a solution that lets you run with or without an accelerator, if an accelerator exists, is more flexible to us than one that, that exclusively requires you can only run with an accelerator and you effectively produce another accelerator, another CNF for the without use case. So that's one thing. But then the other thing, um, and I haven't read this yet, and I need to read it, is the important thing about use cases is they don't dictate what it is we do and don't do. They let us score what we should and shouldn't be doing. So um, when we come to define best practices, we can judge them by the use case saying, this serves this use case well. Um, so if we can come up with, with options that let us do the more flexible rather than the less flexible, and they don't have significant disadvantages, then that might make them a best practice in the sense that it's better than the other practices that we can think of. So the important thing about use cases is they let us choose best practices on whether they are in fact better or not. Yeah. Uh, that's uh, that's completely right. And if uh, Bill, you scroll a little bit down, uh, not up, down. Yeah, these challenges. So essentially, the the best practices on, on the uh, still a bit up on the next chapter that's not visible. Yeah. So I think the use cases. Uh, as as I was uh, actually working on it, uh, it's a subject of, of, of change, but uh, it is a situation that is described and that we are we are facing. And then the challenges and limitations when we run the, the CNFs in Kubernetes, and I'm, I know Kubernetes we need to, to discuss still, but in general, 
the challenges should present the problem for best practices to solve. And then we might go and say, okay, how do we address this challenge number one and challenge number one of use case number seven? You know, is there a best practice we can uh, elaborate uh, on that? Uh, is that really best practice or can we have a consensus and so on? So this should indeed, as, as Jan pointed out, uh, stimulate our discussions. Um, and I think I, I could say that there is no uh, even reference to any accelerator in, in uh, this one. Maybe there is, if I- No, if there's not. Somewhere. Yeah. I, I think that, that there should be there should be no, but uh, what it um, but refers to is essentially uh, what it refers to essentially is even if you have a, a cluster where you have a accelerators on each node, there are some network functions that would do a node pinning uh, and 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 uh, stick to one node for them to function properly, and what we are seeing here when node is not uh, um, a unit of availability when node could be like uh, 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 rebooted and removed out of the cluster every like a couple of days. How is application making sure which can or, or doesn't need to use accelerator, how that application can, can manage that this IPsec, for example, microservice is let's say horizontally scaled and that can uh, take over the existing sessions that we're running via one pod uh, by another pod, which is still healthy. You know, how this migration uh, could happen without any need for orchestration from top or, or uh, dependency that is blocking uh, infrastructure uh, lifecycle yeah. upgrades. You, that, that's correct. If you look at the but, life cycle. Ah, oh, please continue. Uh, yeah, sorry, one paragraph uh, up, you do say that the uh, application should continue functioning without degradation of performance. So. Uh, we need to be very careful in the use case. If that's the requirement, then it rules out a lot of best practices. Yep. If so, we, we it's important that we agree here on how strict we want the use cases to be. I think it says here, uh, CNF shall be capable to bear without visible impact on its function or per or, or, without visible impact on function or performance the situation. Yeah, there so are if, some assumptions. If we are that strict here, then it really limits the the um, type of best practices. If we yeah. give some yeah, flexibility was, here, then it opens up for more best practices. Yeah, I was going to bring up a similar thing as well. Like, uh, and this depends on how we define the CNF. Uh, so, in order to avoid the definition problem, I'm going to talk about a specific uh, packet treatment or specific endpoint that is handling. A, a stream of, of data for this particular example. So when you have uh, in Kubernetes, the way you get a device is through device plugin. Device plugin has a couple very simple APIs, which include the ability to uh, to assign or provision a device to a to a to a workload, and in the process of doing so, it resets the device and then hands it to that particular pod as a, as a think. And one of the problems that we'll run into is that there's no way to tell it, please don't reset this device before I, before I hand it off. There's also issues around device plugin in terms of there's no easy way to, to say that this something is a class of a thing. Like maybe you have a bunch of 100 uh, megabit uh, NICs and then you want, and then you have a certain set that are one gig NICs, they all connect to the same network. You want to consume the 100s, but fail over to the one gigs, uh, which are more expensive. Uh, if you run out of out of 100s, like there's no easy way to perform these type of uh, tasks within the device plugin framework. And this is before you also consider the uh, the relationship uh, or the, the lack of relationship between device plugin and the CNI. So we want to be careful that we don't conflate the overall performance of the system with any given endpoint that we separate these two things out into two separate use cases. Like I might say, I have a Kubernetes cluster that's acting as a, as a firewall and I, all my firewall functions are distributed. So I may lose a pod and maybe I have some slight interruption of service for a subset of my, of my systems while they reconnect. Uh, but 
in the prod, but in the process, I still have my uptime. I still have my availability for most of my applications going through. And what we want to do is try to is first separate these things out and then simultaneously uh, provide information about best practices. Like if you want to achieve the capability to resume the sessions, if you want to achieve these type of things, then we can dive into how do we how do we achieve that? What do you have to pay in order to achieve those particular goals? And are they even reasonable goals to to begin with in this particular environment? Maybe um, maybe at this particular point with the current Kubernetes infrastructure, it may not be reasonable to hit all of these goals. But with changes per uh, maybe in or out of Kubernetes with things that are associated with it, maybe you can achieve these things uh, depending on uh, depending on future advancements. One other thing, um, I'm glad that Vuk put in here that there should be performance limitations um, or considerations. Like, here's the thing, if you hand me something that doesn't run very well, I'm not gonna deploy it in my infrastructure. Uh, this is one of the reasons why I think we try to set up the whole three different like domains within the chairs, this and that is there's gonna be a lot of conflicting opinions. There's gonna be a lot of divergent requirements. And I know we've gotten a little bit softer on the whole, whether we're grading things or this and that, but at the end of the day, this should be the whole entire point of, you know, best practices is if I say that performance, you know, has to meet what look put in expected behavior, then the question is, is, is it a feasible requirement? What are the trade-offs? Like, can I use things like node labels, device plugins, et cetera? Um, you know, what are the expectations from the infrastructure? But if we have something that like doesn't have any hard stances anywhere, then what are we really measuring the best practices against? Um, the, like, this is I feel like a good, the use case should drive situation. requirements. Mm -hmm. yep. uh, this is a good, good situation where we would need uh, a concrete example because this is now very, very high level. And then we are all talking from uh, certain assumptions that we have, uh, and maybe we have even picture uh, when when uh, Jeffrey or Jan are talking. Maybe they have even picture of concrete mm. network function, concrete situation they faced, uh, and that they see difficulties, and then so on. So this is where the, the discussion, um, in my view, uh, could get very tangible, very very specific. And this mm. is why we need also those examples. In I have those examples as well, but I'm not uh, kind of uh, the owner of those in order to bring them like specific vendor X, Y, Z and talk about them here. So this is what uh, uh, should come from the vendors for, and, and there are different uh, applications, uh, or sorry, there are different assumptions. For example, when I say, we need to unpack it. When I say without degradation of performance, I have something specific in mind and I didn't detail that in. But I'm saying if you have a cluster that's comfortable enough that is planned properly, uh, that has maybe, I don't know, 10 nodes or, 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 or enough nodes, you should be able to, to reschedule and you have a, a, a possibility to reschedule your pods on another node. So it's not blocked. It's not like a very, very limited so that you get a degradation. So under this assumption, I expect that uh, the, the function would not degrade. Uh, but of course, if you lose half of the cluster and you can you have to serve, uh, I don't know, thousands or hundreds of thousand sessions uh, with the less capacity, then of course, that's a normal case for degradation. Yeah, uh, but that one better than is, the lo that, loss of better than loss of function uh, in, in that, cloud that, that, uh, native way. Yeah, that, that one's better phrased as um, building up from the bottom, right? Um, we're trying to express the requirements we have on the platform rather than the platform design um, in this, you know, best practices, ideally on a CNF at the moment, at least we're not really talking about best practices for the platform, but what we are going to have to say is something like we expect the platform to tolerate a single point failure, single point failures will have this kind of consequence like lost nodes. And we expect to put the CNF in a position that it can recover based on that and exposed functionality of the platform. Now, Jeff has gone into design considerations in, for instance, that I might use node labels as some part of doing that. And you would have to argue why node labels are sensible and also who's setting them, because it's not obvious to me. In fact, I don't think it's logical that a CNF developer gets to set node labels. I don't think it's logical in an ideal world that a CNF developer knows how many servers are involved. Um, so, 
if it comes down to setting node labels, then obviously that's the operator of the platform that's setting no labels. And you would have to determine whether node labels is what they want to do, because presumably they're identifying specific places to run CNF pieces and also why they're doing it and how they might make choices and this sort of thing. So you've opened a can of To work. be fair though, Ian, on this exact point, right? This is what I was saying. Like we have like the different, um, I forget what you call them. At, well, you call them actors, right? And we don't agree what those are yet either. Um, but this is the whole thing, right? Is Volk and I as providers, and I'm gonna tear into this one, Volk here, because I'm this one is near and dear to my heart, but like there should be like the total expectation that the CNF developer side would come with their own requirements driving use cases, right? And then like mm -hmm. I said, so for one, something like node labels has no business going into this type of document, in my opinion. Like no. it should be like node labels is a best practice because of blah, 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 based on meeting these use cases, right? Yeah. Um, and so, but then that's what I'm hoping this group will figure out is CNF developer says, well, you know, I need deployments or I need daemon steps instead. And if I do node labels, how do I manage all that metadata? Like these are the type of discussions I would hope would come out of this is, we have multiple points of view represented in these use cases driven by what the different requirements are for the different actors. And then we can actually sit down because there's going to be trade-offs. There's no getting around that. There's always bottlenecks, yeah. right? So what are they and what does this group collectively, you know, what grudging agreement do the provider platform side come to with the, um, you know, the CNF developer side, and, you know, how do we get to some uncomfortable compromise in the middle? Totally agreed i mean it, it, the the point is to work out something where a cnf developer can get their job done and a cnf operator can actually make use of the results so that's completely you're, you're not wrong in this and this is where those things should come together and then the implementation should drop out the bottom of it this is okay. one of the reasons why I, i've chosen to put this kind of use case first because it's one that is connecting a lot of uh, uh, players and pieces because CNF developers are developing uh, the CNFs in order for them to be deployed. And if it cannot be deployed or if it, can, it cannot run in the environment where it is operated or it doesn't present the, the options uh, to make it run, then it's a, it's a, it's a work uh, um, uh, wasted. And this is uh, maybe something we need to uh, keep in mind uh, that everything uh, cannot run in, in uh, isolation, but uh, simply say that you will ne not always be able to make choices on, on a vertical integration uh, of the thing and system integration, especially if we talk about cloud. Uh, this is very much different than in a, in a let's say, classical setup where we uh, got uh, this uh, proprietary uh, network functions and, and hardware, then also in the VNF was very much prescriptive by the CNF and in the cloud native world, you don't have a control over the platform. So you cannot specify it. You can just say what capabilities you, you uh, need uh, and when the application will run properly. Okay. But, yeah, that's uh, for the dedicated time, I guess. Yeah, <laughs> clearly this is a very um, inspired discussion today. And I think it's gonna lead to some good discussions down the road and I'm looking forward to those. We do have three minutes left, so I do want to kind of circle back and make sure we kind of have everything covered. Um, in case people missed it, um, Shane put himself up for the service provider chair. Um, and also, like I said before, I'm missing a contact uh, for Chungwei Telecom. Um, the other thing that we discussed last week is there's the current nominations for the tech lead, it closes tonight at midnight if you're interested. These are the people um, that have currently nominated themselves. And one suggestion last week is people that don't win the co-chair election could also be rolled over to the tech lead um, nomination. Um, so I guess if people are interested in that, um, we could also do that too. Um, I, I would rather we did that. I, I want to understand whether a chair would be effectively have all the responsibilities of a tech lead plus the chairman responsibilities as well. So you're saying, can you be elected for both? Or are you asking? Need, or, or indeed, do you need to be? If you're elected as chair, does it? Do you need to stand for tech lead at all? Yeah, I don't. I don't think if you're elected as chair, you need to stand for tech lead. 
Right. So then if we said that those standing for chair are also in the tech lead election and anyone who wins the chair election won't get the tech lead title when we're basically good, I think, aren't we? We're not limiting the number of tech leads. So, I mean, it, it's basically, um, at least I assume we're not limiting the number of tech leads. So as things stand, it's basically majority, well, 60% as things are documented. Yeah, the, the number of tech leads is currently not limited. You just have to be elected by a majority of the voters. So it's however many people the community thinks should be tech leads. Yeah. So I, I would just have some clarity around um, on the chairs who who would be a chair like um, the who you're representing and where you're coming from the so the SP chair I get I guess a little bit of the confusion maybe and I've heard comments so I'm trying to bring this up uh, over the last month at least Shane you're with. Red Hat, and then so that would seem more like not a service provider, unless you're thinking OpenShift. Maybe that's well, that would still be a platform, not a service provider. But what is has there been discussion last week or any clarity around who would be there? Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Well, we've never put in the charter that there's any eligibility requirements on that. So you know, yeah. how would you say that you respect, you, you res do you have to be a member of the Kubernetes community? And what would that mean to represent the Kubernetes community as an example? Do you have to be a member of a company developing CNFs in order to represent CNF developers? I think my yeah. take here would be anyone can stand if they feel they can argue that they're going to go do a good job of representing that community. So if Shane wants to say, I can represent the service provider community and he can persuade everybody that's more true than, you know, everybody else standing, then good on him, honestly. Yeah, exactly. So in case people missed it on the mailing list, Shane is nominating himself for uh, the service provider co-chair based on his uh, in-depth experience with network virtualization at Verizon. I think he was there for some of between 10 and 20 years. So. Uh, that's the clarification from the mailing list from him. Right, um, from I, I don't think he's even been a year at Red Hat. Um, just trying to yeah. bring clarity to it. So I, I, I think I, I understand and maybe agree and like what you said, Ian. If you're interested, then you could put your name up. So I, I suppose this means if you have no experience in any of this, you can still put your name up and then people can decide if they want you to represent. Yeah, and, and I'll just make a call to the voters to make sure that they're choosing, bearing in mind that they're speaking, we all get to vote for all the chairs as things stand, I believe. So um, bear in mind, we're looking for someone who will best represent that community. Yep. Okay. Yeah, and the ballot should be coming out later today. Um, and if you think you should be getting one, but you haven't yet, um, please contact me. So that's all I have for today. Um, thanks everyone for joining. Sorry, we're three minutes over, um, but thanks for staying with us um, if you did. And yeah, um, I look forward to seeing the results from the election. I hope. Thanks, bye. Thanks everybody, bye. Thanks, bye.